Okay. It's done, right? We live? Okay, um, welcome back again. Um, there was a glitch in the network and uh, we're back. And we have with us also We have with us Dr. Islan that just joined us today. And um, we'll be having this discussion together and um, let me hand it over to Dr. Islan as well. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, once again for connecting. And, uh, and thank you very much Abdul and the rest for taking part in this conversation yesterday. And uh, from the name of the section, uh, I can see ICT for D, section three. So this is not ICT for D. This is emerging technologies. Uh, from our schedule, we have just two live interaction for ICT for D. Then we have uh, two more live interaction for emerging technologies. Abu and the team had one yesterday, so we are having the second one. So we'll correct this as we progress. And we still have two more live interaction uh, to do for introduction to innovation. We deliberately push introduction to innovation after uh, because we just want you to have some basic knowledge of uh, what technologies are and uh, what are we expected to drive from uh, using uh, technologies. So I watched the live section yesterday and uh, it's really uh, thrilling to see what I've done the team did yesterday and it's just uh, on plan you know I just uh, take it by surprise for them I say we have this now let's just do it and it's more of like a open heart uh, <laughs> conversation and the energy from the conversation is really really high so what we are doing today is to wrap it up and make it more context uh, specific and uh, we have almost 20 questions uh, we drafted, but I'm not sure if we can cover all the questions. Mm -hmm. But I want us to focus more on emerging technologies for development in Nigeria. You know, last week we had a lot of discussion around ICT for D. So emerging technologies are not necessarily have to be ICT for D, because here with us we have somebody from biology. Right? Yes. And uh, I believe he have a lot to say around what uh, are we getting from emerging technologies uh, in the life sciences. And sometimes if I'm doing this class, I used to have uh, someone from physics, uh, someone from agri, uh, someone from uh, economics. We have someone from finance. So a lot of work is really ongoing. But uh, I asked this question recently in a seminar uh, through mentee, and I asked colleagues to list down emerging technologies they know who they came across. And from my experience and evidence, 99 or 95% or up more are basically emerging technologies that have to do with ICT. But that's the only thing most of us are much, much more familiar with. So, but before we go deep into that, uh, I will ask. Um, uh, my colleague to the left, Abdul Hamid, to list down emerging technologies that are in life and health sciences. Mm. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Yeah. Good morning once again. Mm. The example of emerging technology in biology, which include the DNA synthesis, uh, CRISPR gene editing, and also uh, modern biotechnology play an important role in the field of emerging technologies. That's it. Okay, so but beyond that, that is, that is too many. So maybe if I ask this question to Abdul Latif, how do you think, uh, because now uh, I watched a documentary not long ago uh, around emerging technology mm -hmm. for the future of a human. And, and now people are even preserving their dead body, thinking that in the future they could have a second chance to live again. <laughs> You know, and it's not a job. And I know scientists are working so hard by working around DNA and the rest of technology associated to extend human life. 
you know. Uh, and, and beyond that, they are even thinking of uh, curing death because they see death as a disease, <laughs> you know. So, uh, if, if you look at that, Abdul, how do you think these emerging technologies could accelerate healthcare delivery? I don't want to talk about COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> yeah, because we know we got COVID-19 vaccine because we have an uh, intersection of yeah. bio and infotech, right? Yeah. So how do, we, how do you think we can use these technologies beyond healthcare? Because we got COVID-19 vaccine because of the power of AI. But if you have a vaccine, it takes like 10 to, or more than uh, 10 years to have a vaccine because it must go through different drug discovery process. Mm. and so that you can have the efficiency and the efficacy. So now, can we talk to us about agriculture? Because food security is a big issue in Nigeria. Yeah. Even recently, the federal government changed the name of the Ministry of Agri to have additional mandate, Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security. How do you think we can use emerging technologies? So um, when you talk about agriculture, it's a field that is very, very diverse in the sense that there are uniqueness with environment and the type of crops you can grow, right? And also climates do affect these things. And for a crop to grow well, you still need to gather important and relevant data that has to do with that crop, how it makes its yields, and also the season of the year that those crops can grow. So if you have this data, you are able to train them using any of these um, uh, AI-related uh, emerging technologies, you'll be able to predict, you know, what kind of crop will be grown in a certain location and um, how well they will grow and what timeline, you know, that you take to grow. So in that sense, food security is secured. You know what is being produced in a location. and so From produce to the entire chain of supply to the market, you can also use uh, technology like blockchain to know where um, a crop is being produced, when it's being moved to, and um, what is even um, the uh, quality or validity of the crops. If it's going to go bad, if it's bad, and and you know sometimes you can also use um, mark skin, you know, to know the kind of diseases that comes or associate with it. So these are some of the few things that you can do uh, using emerging technology in the area of agriculture. Yeah, so thank you very much, Abdul. I think uh, if I summarize for some of our participants that are early entry into technology, yeah. I can summarize a few things from what you said. Blockchain, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is part of the um, uh, distributed ledger technology. Most of us are very much familiar with blockchain. Uh, with crypto. With crypto. <laughs> but we could use blockchain technology to yeah. track... Uh, uh, farming process in general and cloud computing, you know, and IoT. You know, people are not talking about smart and precision agriculture where you use less water, less fertilizer, less chemical. So I think the potential is really, really high around that. But maybe if I ask uh, Ibrahim this question, how far do you think we have gone with regards to application of this technology in Nigeria? Taking that question, I would say uh, Nigeria is still, still a baby <laughs> in the field. <laughs> Apart from uh, with the aspect of uh, AI that it's been improving and uh, circulating around the world, we see Nigeria adopting uh, AI, but most technologies that are, that are still emerging, mm -hmm. Nigerians have not really, have not really grasped the, the, the principle behind uh, using those technologies to further improve the economy and product uh, improve the productivity of Nigeria as a whole. Yeah, so uh, if I ask uh, Emmanuel this question, uh, it's a straightforward. Uh, you are working around food security, uh, consumer moving goods, and how do you think we can use AI, uh, particularly to ensure we have good value system around that sector? I'm not limiting that to the AI, maybe I can say emerging technologies around that sector. Okay, so... Um, maybe if you take, maybe I can say maybe it's more specific, uh, environmental waste. Okay. Because it's a big issue now in Nigeria. Yeah. How do we use uh, this emerging tech to reduce environmental waste? Because we talk about uh, climate change, climate adaptation, 
you know, how do you think we can use this tech to, to reduce this gap? Okay, so if we um, using some Internet of Things module mm -hmm. and um, artificial intelligence, we can gather data based on temperature, emission. We can get like a, um, we can track the current weather, temperature of a place for, let's say, five years. And with that, we'll be able to make predictions. For example, you taught, you, uh, you taught us that India in 2027, they will have water scarcity in India. So how did they know this? They, uh, they got to know about this using emerging technologies like the artificial intelligence to gather data and to predict what will happen uh, as a nation, where to invest and where to channel our energy. Okay. If I can just team in yeah. on that. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, Enver, when you talk about waste, you're talking about the things that we don't need, we want to throw away, right? In some places, they do what they call the recycling, right? So if you train the data that you have from, you know, the type of waste that comes along, and you're able to train a, uh, an AI model to recognize uh, a paper from a plastic, a plastic to a trash, a trash to whatever, and you have some kind of smart beams <laughs> that when you come to throw them, this sort of thing can be done automatically, and you can easily remove the rubber for the rubber companies, you know, to reproduce. The paper, you can easily, you know, use them for the like of tissue paper and stuff. So you have smart devices that can do this using the combination of the training you've done with the data set you have, and also the sorting is done based on, you know, the picture that they see coming into the trash. I think this will be another way that we can, you know, sort out recycles and waste. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Abdul. I think uh, the discussion is going much more deeper now. So let's talk about Nigeria, Abdul Hamid. Abdul, I mean Abdul Hamid. Uh, how do you think startups are taking advantage of emerging technology? Do you know any successful startup that breakthrough? We're talking about unicorn. If you look at the unicorn ranking in Africa. Nigeria is not really do, doing bad in that regard. So can you give us any uh, good case study? Because the essence of this program is by the end of the program, the participants should be able to have opportunity uh, to contribute to the digital economy. Um, I think in the financial sector, Nigeria is doing very well in adopting emerging technologies, uh, um, most especially in the fintech industry. We have uh, companies like Andela, Flutterweave that are integrating online platforms and uh, all of those technologies in order to streamline their activities and financial transactions. Um, also, we have, uh, we have companies like Paystack and Strive, which are also doing the same thing uh, in terms of uh, integrating technology with uh, financial in inclusion and all that. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I think beyond that, uh, even here in, at Bayes University, we have a very robust engagement. Uh, most of the participants know uh, Dominion. Dominion is a leading blockchain company in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we jointly apply and got this grant together. And they're here currently uh, at Bayes University. And they have an office in London. They have an, an office in, in Riyadh. In part, when you, when you talk about blockchain in the entire African ecosystem they are leading, and I always tell this story. Uh, the largest crowd we had at this university is when we had the blockchain summit. When we had advertised, we got almost 6,000 people that visit our university within uh, three days. And that clearly shows uh, emerging technology is not something really new to Nigeria. And currently at this university, we are looking at the possibility of applying blockchain for environmental protection, as Emmanuel said. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of using emerging technologies to speed up agriculture. So we have ongoing work uh, with the ENCA, National Center for AI. It's a subsidiary of NIDA, National Information Technology Development Agency. They are partner of this program. And I think the next section we may have the DG of NIDA uh, to talk to us around what NIDA is doing to innovate with emerging technologies. 
So at healthcare, uh, here in this university, we have uh, one of the world-class hospitals, and we are applying emerging technologies to, to improve uh, service delivery, to, to improve uh, effective uh, patient engagement. And if you take uh, uh, mining, you know, it's one of the most expensive industry uh, to, to, to operate. Uh, early commerce don't really go in there. The dominant operators operate. And we have seen how uh, emerging technologies, remote sensing, uh, AI, neural network, machine learning, being used uh, to, to get the mineral resources without having to struggle, without having to go into very excavation. horrible excavation and mining process. With satellite, you can easily do that. And even recently, we have seen how military use uh, satellite technologies to track and crack down the bandits, uh, the militants who are blowing our pipeline. I think, if, uh, Abdul Hamid, you work with oil and gas sector. Yeah. And uh, maybe as we progress, you can share more uh, of what uh, you guys are doing with, uh, with, uh, with, with AI. I mean, we have seen how pipeline vandalization be reduced. In fact, to some extent, even in Amazon forest. You know, Amazon forest is very big. You know? yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I say this story all the time. If a tree is cut up at Amazon forest, before the end of the day, the government, the authority knows a tree is cut up. Because they are using what? Machine technology, yeah. I mean machine learning, to learn if the tree is being cut up. So the potential for this uh, ecosystem is really, really very high. So let me focus this discussion to one of the most important part, education. We are all working in education. Uh, two days ago, I participated in a conference uh, looking at the edutech in Nigeria. And I think on, on Tuesday, I gave a keynote speech at the Federal Ministry of Education, looking at the possibility of using data. Data is an emerging technology. Data analytics is an emerging technology. It's an emerging issue that is ongoing. Dashboard. People are not used to dashboarding in many organizations. But now it's becoming something that you see in every executive's uh, table. Uh, number three, you talk about GIS, Geographic Information System. National Population Commission spent huge amount of money uh, through estuary to invest in uh, mapping uh, and the rest of the Geographic Information System technology. So if you take education, Emmanuel, in Nigeria, learning poverty is, a, is as high as almost 90%. Globally, learning poverty is about 56%. So if for every 100 children you see, or youngsters you see in the school, half of them are not learning anything in the school. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 86%. Means only about 14% of our children are learning something. If you take Nigeria, it's almost 90%. And it's been excavated because of the insecurity in almost 10 states in Nigeria. And many schools are closed for over six years, some even as much as seven, eight years, not open, as well as climate change. Many children are no longer going to school because their parents cannot afford to take them uh, back to school. Then you talk about COVID-19, where we were rendered uh, just useless. We have no action to do, no capacity, right? So if you took a learning poverty deep, in a state where I came from, Jigawa State, learning poverty is 99%, which means if you have 100 children that are going to school, only one out of them achieve the minimum proficiency level to solve a simple math and do a simple reading. And if you cannot read, it's a big issue. If you talk about machine learning, if you talk about generative AI, it's just reading. It's reading through the existing content. And it's given us how to based on the model built within. So how do you think we can use these emerging technologies, not only AI, not only uh, 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 blockchain, because we have issue of out-of-school children. Where are they? In fact, I read a report recently from School of African and Oriental Studies. It's one of the London uh, University system. They said in their report, about 20 million children may never go back to school in Nigeria. It's a big issue. And if you have 20 million children not going to school or not going back to school, it's a big issue. But beyond that, you also have issue of not in school, not in employment, not in training. And that have to do with youngsters from the age of maybe 12 all the way to maybe 70.
because you could see many people have nothing to add in the national economy. Then you have issue of children that are in the school not learning. And the problem is children that are in the school not learning, they almost double children not in the school or children that left school. So how can we use emerging technologies to take back children back to school? And beyond that, how can we use these emerging technologies to improve relevance of the education at the same time maintaining quality? This is a question for you. Maybe probably Emmanuel and Abdul can respond to this. Okay. I know Abdul is doing a lot around uh, education. Right. Education is uh, a big concern, and the data is really, really shocking. Um, first thing, before you can use a technology for people in the grassroots that don't know how to speak English very well is a problem. So the first thing the emerging technology ought to do is to see how those English content can be translated into their local language for easy consumption. That's the first thing you do. So you don't need any kind of big thing to do. It's just to do the training, um, mapping the local dialect with the English content. And as they assess it, they're able to understand it, consume it, to understand it themselves. So that solves the first problem. The second thing is how you now create awareness around it that what you're learning is actually something that benefits you. So awareness, which is to change their social understanding about uh, what they think. Some people might think the computer is spying on them. So that understanding of, no, this is meant to teach you, to educate you, to take you from a point where you are ignorant to where you become learned. And when you create that, you bring that confidence in them and they begin to use. So content design specifically for their use, to move them from where you want them to be, right? It's what you, the imagine technology is you do. So you can start introducing them one by one. So you might not be able to do that with the kind of connectivity infrastructure we have now, but you have to devise a way of having something stored somewhere that they can easily access without even going to the internet or whatever. So I think this is one of the ways that you can use those kind of technologies. OK, so I also think um, our database has to be improved from NIMC. Because um, these figures are alarming. <laughs> and the question is, where are these people? We can't track them. We don't know their progress. There's no data showing their progress. So I will go back to, um, to AI using the Amazon forest Dr. Rizlan talked about mm -hmm. as, a, as a case study for, for these kids, where we know that one million children were born between January 1st until December 31st from a particular state, we'll make plans for them, knowing that in the next three years, they should be at least in Nazare 1. In the next three years, when we get 500 coming to school, we'll know there is a problem. So we can only know this if we have a robust database that, um, that captures the progress of these children. So, just like you have said, rightly said again, um, machine learning, we, can, we need to localize our content. Sometimes we go through double ways to learn. Maybe as an Igbo person, I don't understand how to speak <laughs> English. And I'm getting, um, I'm getting a physics question to solve in English, and I don't understand English. So I think we can use tools like the generative AIs to translate some of this content into our local content. It will aid, um, it will aid understanding. Thank you. So I mean, let me make it very open to all. Yeah. I want to hear your uh, opinion. Adding on to that, uh, insecurity is an issue <laughs> that must be improved. That must be looked at, and I think uh, government has still there. There are there are initiatives already that are looking at the issue of improving uh, national security. But uh, we, the participants we have uh, attending this live program now, 
YouTube is also a platform that could be used to train a lot of laser children. Whereby, if they have knowledge, uh, awareness of uh, what, what, what they want to do, what, uh, about education, education about using uh, these tools, most of them, uh, you, there was a time uh, Dr. Island said uh, farmers on the, on, the, on, the distant, on, the, on the farmland in the north, they are able to use uh, WhatsApp. And what does he do? He just uses uh, voice, voice alone, voice alone. You can see technology has come a long way from st uh, simple testing to uh, videos to pictures to audios. And using audios alone, he's able to communicate, he's able to sell his product, he's able to do, uh, do that. So making content that are generic for different individuals. You could have uh, YouTube uh, videos in Yoruba, in Hausa, in English, that displays content particular to those uh, adult place children. And I pr with that, I think uh, the sky is limit, and then uh, they can further be the, the numbers, uh, the 90% out of adult place children will surely be reduced. Yeah. Lamed, you want to add something? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I believe uh, by the use of these technologies, I think there are greener patch, uh, pastures ahead. Uh, the government can uh, leverage on their power uh, to empower people and uh, create digital literacy. We, they can, um, they can uh, uh, um, localize the content for, 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 the, for the masses uh, in such a way that there will be um, they will be having content in their local languages. Uh, also, uh, there are several empowerment schemes that uh, can be initiated uh, in, uh, in order to uh, pro make, uh, make progress in, uh, in such fields. So, do you have something to add, no. Ibrahim? Uh, so, I think uh, generally, uh, I've seen how uh, emerging technologies are used in many countries. In fact, I gave this example on Tuesday when I gave my keynote speech. Uh, if you take uh, China, in 1990, access to higher education in China was 2.6%. Only about 2.6 Chinese goes to higher education, which means Polytechnic College of Education, University, and any other uh, institution after SSE, only 2.6%. And if you look at China in 1990, it's just like Nigeria. But within 30 years to date, I look at the statistics. Uh, in China now, access to higher education is 59%, which means 59% of Chinese have access to or have access or are enrolled into higher education. So you could see what China did, and basically they leverage emerging technologies. In Nigeria, access to higher education is about 10%, which means for every 10 people you see, only one, or maybe for every 100 you have, only about 10 have access to higher education. And the reality is we don't have the money to put every child back to school. We don't have the money because digital learning is very expensive. And digital learning is much more difficult than the usual uh, brick and mortar. And I'm talking about from evidence done, uh, I mean evidence of research done in our university. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, cost of infrastructure, Abdul, you work with Telco. Abdul worked in one of the leading telecommunication companies in Nigeria. And he, I mean, we have worked together in different projects with the Smart Village, um, IEEE, Technology for Development, and the rest. And the quality of service is definitely not really too good about. Uh, I can see from the comment of the learners, some say we are struggling, we cannot connect, we don't have power, and this and that. So if I ask this question to you, Abdul, what is the future? We, you think we can uh, go through with these emerging technologies, particularly looking at education. How can we use emerging technologies, remote learning, uh, blended learning, flip learning, flex learning, uh, maybe a la carte uh, model of digital learning, leveraging on renewable energy. I think the, the, the promise is really uh, very, very uh, visible, as well as the power of using AI to test students. As an educator, that's my major worry. You know, uh, if you allow students to learn from on their own, uh, not in the classroom, even in the classroom, students always like to misbehave. So, how can we use this technology uh, to to accelerate education? Because education is one of the major major driver of uh, of SDG. If you don't have good education, you have a problem. So, just wrap it up so that we can drop education and move to the other. Uh, 
uh, yeah. area of interest. How can we use this technology? In summary, well, if you are well, given opportunity to be the Minister of Education yes. or Minister of ICT, how can, we, how can you use this technology? To, to, to accelerate this or to reduce this learning poverty is a big issue. Yeah. School deprivation is a big issue and learning deprivation. Because if learners are not learning, it's a big issue. If children are not going to school, it's a big issue. So number one problem is we have learning deprivation. We have school deprivation. Yeah. Then we have learning poverty. Yeah. So how do you... So, do you know, these are big issues, really. And for you to first teach any child, mm -hmm. that child must be well-fed. <laughs> so you're going back to the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? So for someone to be able to learn anything, it needs to be in the right mind to learn. So one thing we need to do, government need to do, is to make sure that those kids that are to be taught anything needs to be well-fed right but how do we now control that the resources to feed these kids get to the hands of the people that will feed them that's where technology like blockchain can be adopted right i'm giving mr a this amount of money and it gets to mr a so you track the entire chain you make sure it gets there then going further infrastructure all these gadgets needs to be in place you cannot give everyone a tablet. You cannot give multiple people, you know, devices to own. But there's something you can do. You can either send one truck to a village, and that truck has the probability of connecting, you know, to the global content, and that content can be synced into those devices, and they can use it from time to time to teach, right? So what you need to do, you just need a truck, a mobile truck, maybe with sustainable and renewable clean energy on it, and a kind of clean communications that can sync from time to time, and you drive it village by village by village by village, and you have people that deliver this content. It's one of the smart ways you can go about it. Before you start dipping every money into pocket to provide maybe fiber connectivity for every uh, village that will take donkey years to come. So you have like your mobile communication classroom, you take them village to village to village and make sure that these are well coordinated content that we teach people. I think that will create an impact. Yeah, so thank you very much, Abdul. I just did a simple Google search now, uh, the cost of digital uh, learning <laughs> in the world, and the, the figure I got from UNICEF website is really staggering, $1.4 trillion. <laughs> so that's the cost we need to put together to have digital education across. And I like what Abdul said. and. What you said is not a fiction. Not uh, in true. East African countries, when COVID-19 came, and even in Latin America, uh, you know, they combated the school bus as a digital hub. So they move around, the buses move around neighborhood, children connect from their homes, and they have tablet that they go along with. Then if you, I mean, I like telling story. In Nigeria, there is a lot of effort done together. Mm -hmm. And you see, mind you, Abdul, even if you have the emerging technologies, our, you, our ability to use them is one of the major issues. And that is the focus of our discussion for the next five to 10 minutes. So if you look at the uh, uh, in global indicators, Nigeria is number four in terms of technical know-how. It's number four, and I have said this last week. And if you look at the digital learning uh, ecosystem in Nigeria, and from our panel last week, I'm going to share the report with, my, uh, with the participant. And I think I share with all of you in our emerging technology class. You know, so if you look at the indicators, in Nigeria we have this learning passport, we have Ignite, a uh, well done platform. Uh, because if you look at digital education, we have four issues around there connectivity and basic infrastructure is number one. Number two, you have the content, uh, and someone from the uh, uh, YouTube Live made a comment that we need to convert this into a local language. All of us are <laughs> not uh, uh, English. Okay. Or, I mean, English people, we just learn how to speak English. I think that's one of the major problems yeah. that I is experiencing. Number two, uh, the teacher and the student are not digitally ready. Because earlier on, we talked about computer literacy. Now it's digital literacy. In fact, we are moving away from even digital literacy is what? Digital competency. I remember 13 years ago here in this university, I spent four months teaching children how to use, or learners, or students how to use mouse. Practically, we have young kids in the room. Uh, 
at any age of one, two, three, four, they already know how to click and drag and drop. So this illiteracy is at a high uh, point now, but still children are not learning. And part of the uh, uh, finding from the research published by Center for the Study of the Economy of Africa, access to telecommunication services in Nigeria is 91%. So I'm putting this question open to you. Do you think we need to go through learning management software? Even most of our students now struggle. Yeah, online. Online. They struggle with the connectivity. Even beyond that, they struggle with the portal. Because this is a program that we designed to have just 900. We end up having over 100,000 participants. Now, we put about 56 to learn. When we move forward, we have about 16,000. Probably when we are moving to the physical state, we may not have up to eight. A majority of them, we read the emails. It's overwhelming. Uh, sometimes we've got about 500 emails. And we have other jobs to do. We are doing this as a secondary job, not as a primary job. It's a big challenge. So I'm going to put a question around that. Then number two, majority of them no want to learn, but they have this limitation of infrastructure. How do you think we can use this, maybe AI, to solve these basic problems, to solve these infrastructural problems? And we know we don't have the money. The money is not there. Someone just posted uh, uh, an email to me uh, with a very long love letter that we need to provide this infrastructure. But this infrastructure is not there. How do you think we can, we can put that? And I've said to the participant, this is not uh, the usual lecturer come to class and teach with marker and pen and go. You know, we want to do things completely different. We want to hear your own opinion. And participant, if you can hear us, Go online, post your answer for us. We want to see uh, okay. what do you think, uh, what do you think so, we need to do? Because most of them, we have professors, we have vice chancellors, we have CEOs, we have innovators, we have civil society organizations from the uh, participants. Just share your thoughts for us, please. Okay, for me, something comes to mind. For you to be able to solve this kind of problem, you, you stated that there's infrastructure deficit, right? So what do we currently have in these locations? Perhaps post office, uh, um, maybe a transmission switch, right? These are hubs. You can take this as a hub, right? And what do you do with an hub? Try to focus on the hub alone. How did hub, this hub get the content that you want to impact to a certain community? We do elections in this country, and you have people travel to almost every part of the country, right, to conduct elections. You take this place as hub. And this hub is where you focus on dealing the infrastructure problems. You have technology like FSOC, you have um, white space, um, uh, TV white space communications, you have optics, right? This hub must not have problem. So the people to learn, how do you solve their problem? If government can invest in a mobile phone per home, or a tablet per household, or a laptop per household, these things, you can get them less than $100 if you want. And these people go to this hub to sync information that they will use for learning. And you can only get that content when you've completed the previous ones. So tools like um, the, the AI algorithm, what they were able to say, okay, this guy has already tried. He has completed reading. Um, is he go to school? So now he can take um, the next content. And they sync. So multiple people go there to sync information, but not that they're having a real time. But to them, it's a real time thing because they are collecting and they're learning. And after they are done, they go sync more. This will reduce the budget to use. That's number one. And also, you are able to achieve the learning objective that you've set aside to do. I think this will, is something that we need to pursue. Yeah, thank you very much, Abdul. Someone just posted something from the group uh, and, and really, 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 really very interesting. <laughs> Uh, and, and by name, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, I'm just trying to go down. Sarah said, but sir, you must not have up to $1.4 trillion to start. Mm -hmm. We can start from somewhere and it will grow with a strong company. Yeah. I think I like what Sarah said. $1.4 trillion is a big money. And uh, I, remember, I remember the, the chief of UNICEF, uh, Herriata, said this in one of the gatherings. He said, when COVID-19 came, I cannot remember the actual figure, but a lot of money bigger than this was gathered for palliative and whatever. She said, why can't we have this same uh, effort and put this money so that we can educate these children? 
because the danger of not educating these children is massive uh, as we progress. But I also like what she said. What we are doing now is similar to what uh, Sarah just said. You know, I've said this, when we got this grant, we were given opportunity to train only 900 learners. But we were able to scale it up uh, for the application process, 100,000, right? Over, I mean, 109,000. Now, 58,000 were enrolled. And I've told the team that we need to open the quiz. As people go into the quiz, we can add them up into uh, the next and next and next model. So it will not cost us any additional money to do that. The only thing maybe that we may have to cause is the, 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 the cloud and, and the storage, which is really, really crazy. Mm -hmm. In part, what we are paying now for cloud storage, we are paying like 300 times bigger than what we plan to do. <laughs> I think that's the cause we just have to be. In part, Abdul, we just have to change completely the way we even plan to do the assessment. Because earlier when we planned to do very rigorous assessment, but with the number, we now just have to innovate. In part, I told this story early morning to a friend of mine. I have like 7,900 assignments dropped by students. I don't have the energy to go through all the 7,900 assignments. But we are building, leveraging the AI system to check and ensure what students submitted is good or not good. And I tell all this story, uh, digital assessment is an emerging technology. And for the last nine years in this university, we have exposed most of our colleagues to begin to assess digital uh, uh, assessment. And I, I tell this story all the time, the last time I marked student assignment or, uh, or student uh, uh, exams, at undergraduate level is almost nine years. So we use rubric, we use other AI tools to ensure students are meeting up the learning aspect. I think, I think that's the practice. Uh, and the same thing in many uh, universities all over the world, a lot of investment has been done. But the problem, again, is this AI or data or whatever is embedded into our privacy. In fact, somebody said this to us not long ago. He said, if data is the next oil, privacy is the next climate change. Yes. You know? Right. Google knows much more than what uh, we know about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Google is tracking us. It's taking every bit of our data. It's embedding into our privacy. And I have to say that I like telling stories. We are currently doing a research uh, from a grant we got from Notre Dame University in the U.S. Looking at the AI ethics. Because if you have data, you have cloud computing, you have everything put together, a neural network, this machine is leveraging on what he or she has been, uh, because I have to make this, some of these neural networks have already identified as a, as a, as a she or he. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think we can maintain learners' privacy, at the same time maintain uh, learners' uh, 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 data, at the same time putting everything within the context of AI, it's because AI have about seven dimensions. AI things have about seven dimensions. Impartiality, you know, accountability, privacy, and the rest. So how do we think, because if you talk about Nigeria, I mean, I like making this our uh, reference to Nigeria. We have the Data Protection Act in Nigeria, very robust act. Then we have the Data Protection Agency. And we have the National Center for AI. And just this morning, I had a chat with uh, Ajala, He's the uh, new head of the Center for AI and the Robotics, uh, trying to put an invitation for him if he can join us in the, next, uh, in the next section. So we have the Data Protection Act, very forward thinking in Nigeria. We have the Center for AI and Robotics. And I think from the 15 to 18, Nigerian government is assembling 150 uh, top AI experts in Nigeria and beyond to discuss about the future of AI. I think we are going in the right direction. So maybe if I ask this question to any one of you, what are the tax or programs put together by the private sector to ensure they are matching with what government is doing with regards to leveraging on emerging technologies? And we also have the Center for Biotechnology, right? It's one of the Nigerian agency regulating what to do and what not to do with the biotech. We have the Center for Space Research uh, agency, right? We have the new side. So in reality, neither know they carry last. <laughs> you know, so what private sectors are doing with regards to this uh, ecosystem of emerging technologies? It's an open discussion to, to all of you. And also to the participants. I know we have many medical doctors uh, that are doing this program. We have lawyers, we have top professionals. Please put your thought for us. 
It's an open discussion. So, so uh, you want to start? What? Yes, sir. Okay. So the Nigerian university are more ab uh, advanced, advanced at understanding what talent looks like and also improving access to facilities, mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. mobility, and increased creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, the increased diversity results in a more creative and innovative workforce, also play an important role. And also the academic uh, researchers is an instrument in giving more and more information about the companies or competitive. And also it can incite to develop new ideas in some Lead, and also it can lead to creation of spine out of the companies and, and also increasing collaboration in the form of spine out and specific partnership between the private sector and the university researchers teams could resolve some some challenges thank you sir. yeah thank you Abdul. so private companies i know i've seen uh, ibm come in nigeria um launch the digital africa um platform um, that gives opportunity to uh, Africans to learn any uh, emerging technologies, you know, program and get badge and certificates, right? So this is one way that uh, such companies have come. Microsoft too, right? Cisco. So all these companies have come to launch programs in line with emerging technologies for free. Here in Nigeria is accessible. If you go online and you go to Google and you put, uh, uh, I think there's these uh, courses that Google have put together that you can learn anything from anywhere at any time at your pace, right? They've invested in the cloud. They've invested in everything that you need to succeed. If you have the passion to do so, it's available. So they've gone a long way. And I've seen uh, companies like MTN Airtel provide uh, chargeback services where they give you free SIM card and you are able to access content. You understand, uh, if you are not browsing or doing Facebook or whatever, you can access educational content for free without needing to buy data. So I think uh, they've tried to you know, complement what government is doing. Yeah, thank you very much. So I, I have a few comments coming from the participant, a uh, very interesting comment. Uh, I'll, I'll suggest uh, if colleagues can really uh, go in there and I see. And Abdul, I wanted you to say what your company is doing because uh, in terms of telco, yeah, your company is number two or three. Okay. You know, I know that is not ranking, but I know we are the internet we are using now to do this program is yeah. coming from Abdul's uh, yes. company. So what we've done is to try to do what they call clustering. We cluster all the institutions in Nigeria, really. And those institutions that are like five kilometers to 10 kilometers away from us, we connect them. We've connected Bayes University. We've connected Nile University. We've connected many other universities like that. And we're still going. So we've done clustering. We've mapped them. And now what we want to do is to go down to the grassroots, which are those infrastructure that we have that is closer to this school. And we'll provide subsidy for them to be able to you know, connect to us. And we'll provide much more what they can get you know, to get the education going. I think this is one of our CSR. And perhaps we're even doing other things that has to do, like delivering lectures in schools. You know, um, the experts within our company do visit school and deliver free lectures to university, to school, and, and even partake in their STEM education program, where we bring in the gadgets and everything to make sure that they get the right learning at the right time. Yeah, thank you very much. And, 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 and just to, uh, to add more to what Abdul said, and also from what the participants said, they are suggesting we use mobile phones because uh, we have over 91% of Nigerians have access to mobile phones. And I think from the data from NCC website, we have almost 280 million <laughs> active telephone lines. So much bigger than even the number of Nigerians. And WhatsApp users are incredible. Uh, so I, I think that's why we focus this learning to be done by Telegram. And I think Abdul can confirm to us, <laughs> the learners are more engaging using Telegram. Because it takes time to log into the portal. And someone said this, that can we make this for the learners to learn at their own? Yes, learners can learn at their own pace. This live interaction is not compulsory that you must attend, mm. but it gives you opportunity to ask questions, to interact with us. And as you know, after this engagement, we share the video in your platform and uh, we can see many people are accessing that but going forward someone mentioned uh, things like LinkedIn learning IBM learning 
Udemy, uh, and even this learning, we have Coursera. Uh, NIDA generously gave us Coursera license. We have about 4,000 Coursera license. So most of our participants that scale through the first stage of learning, that are not coming to learn with us in our campus uh, or in our physical location, we will enroll them into Coursera learning so that they can learn as they are learning with us online. And at the same time, uh, we are looking at the possibility of expanding the physical presence. For now, the Gaster government generously uh, supported us, and they are taking 1,000 youngsters uh, to be trained in person. And the government have made commitment to add 3,000 uh, learners into the learning scope. Mm -hmm. Because from the application, we have about 4,000 learners from Jigawa State. Kaduna State government is talking to us for a possibility of having uh, a physical learning casino, the same thing. So we are looking at uh, expanding that. But uh, believe me, learning can happen much better online than even uh, in person. Uh, because there is a lot of innovation in the digital learning and uh, digital uh, education. So, and someone mentioned WHO, uh, someone mentioned uh, private sector uh, doing well, and someone mentioned blockchain for healthcare. Uh, so, I think uh, we'll put this on hold and move to the next uh, piece of question. Corruption <laughs> is one of the major problems in, in Africa. I remember last year when I had my class, I asked the participant, what are the major issues militating Nigeria? the first visible thing we see is corruption. You know, and I've seen how many countries use this emerging tech uh, to completely eliminate corruption to some uh, very minimal level. And it, I mean, I always talk about UAE and procurement. It's not an empire. Yesterday I had my uh, class with my master's student and one lady from uh, one of the government agencies, she's working on procurement, and she was able to show us innovation around uh, innovation, I mean, uh, around procurement system. So, what are the emerging technology do you think we can use to stop corruption in Nigeria? Do you think emerging technology can help us reduce corruption to, to, yes. to a minimum? Okay. And, and this is an open question to, to all of you. Okay. you want to say something? So, which area of the government do we have corruption? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Everywhere. Just, just so, so now I know the, before you even talk about the voting process itself that brings in these people, right? How do we fortify that? I think blockchain has solution to um, the problem of voting. Uh, you know, when you have multiple people, unique identity, and everybody know who has voted, who hasn't voted, and that alone will solve that problem. So, number one, we're able to solve the corruption that is tangled around our electoral process with blockchain. And when you talk about um, the issue about uh, transaction and stealing and all that, I think to some extent blockchain will be one of the emerging technology and even uh, AI in the sense that frauds are able to easily you know, uh, be detected. Forensic can be done easily with these uh, machine learning uh, tools. So once you're able to put this all together and implement them and have policy that make sure it works in the country, to some extent people cannot loot or steal money from the public coffers easily. And even tax will be well efficiently managed and reported for than for anyone to just deep pocket and just move it somewhere else. Yeah, so thank you very much. I, I've seen very interesting uh, comment coming from uh, Gold Platinum Construction Limited, is one of the participants, but he uses his company's uh, Google account. <laughs> he said, in the area of geology, emerging technology can reduce illegal mining by making use of GIS, satellite, remote sensing. It can also reduce the lack of water in some part of Nigeria. I think this is exactly what Emmanuel said, and I shared this story with you in one of our lectures of emerging technologies. Uh, you know, India, using the remote sensing, they discovered that they will run into water shortage in the next few years to come. And that's why they have to stop exporting rice. Because every bag of rice they export out of India, they're exporting uh, 100 ga gallons of, of water. So with that, they were able to minimize the risk of not, I mean, if you don't have water in your country, it's, it's really a very, uh, very uh, serious issues. Uh, I, I think someone also mentioned um, uh, corruption, influencing uh, this nation, yes, but, that's why we are doing this program. And by the end of the six months of planning, 
most of the participants are civil servants, some are military, uh, some are teachers. We could be able to take some learning uh, from the program and develop a solution that could reduce uh, some of our impact. One of the participants messaged me yesterday. Uh, he is a lab scientist, but he's working with one of the School of Health Technology in Nigeria, and he said uh, he is already thinking of how to make his university E by reducing the number of days taken to do uh, examination, number of days taken to mark and grade and publish results, at the same time reducing uh, the, the, the student not learning, and at the same time supporting learners to be connected to the digital platform. I think this is a good initiative, and that's why after the six months engagement, you have six months internship, so which we would love to see you developing. Not necessarily you must develop a complete end-to-end -end solution, we can cluster you, and that's why in the application process we ask about your domain and discipline. Mm -hmm. So we could cluster you into a different domain of expertise, then a lot can come out of that. And we have amazing uh, uh, facilitators. And I have to say this at this time, all these five gentlemen that you see here are my PhD students. And you know, we are looking, all of them have amazing ideas, the energy around them is massive, and the interest is massive, and this is wicked. And we didn't plan for this. I say, can you just, uh, uh, just come and let us have this interaction? And they are amazing. They are doing a lot in their field. So going forward, Abdul, uh, Emmanuel, Ibrahim, Abdul Hamid, uh, we want to see more of you doing this. And I'm bringing the rest of the PhD students for a possibility of creating a cluster. And for the participant, if you have any genuine idea uh, that you are doing, that you think can support this program, feel free and, and just uh, put it across for us. And we value your feedback. That's why last week we shared um, uh, a questionnaire that we say, please, if you have any feedback, you have any suggestion, uh, put it up for us. We'll be happy to take this. And I keep saying this, <clears throat> the, the title for this program is what? It's ideas. And if I ask the colleague, what is ideas? It's innovation in the development and the effectiveness of skills acquisition. So we have to innovate. We have to be effective in what we do. And if there is anything you think uh, is no good, and we just have to throw it out. And that's the generic, generic uh, characteristics of uh, emerging technologies. They are not cast in stone. As you progress, you keep changing, you keep modeling. And that's why even the leaders, Microsoft, they keep changing their Windows operating system. Just yesterday, I upgraded my Android uh, mobile phone. And the possibility, the changes, the new features coming from that is massive. So if you take corruption, uh, again, uh, someone from the platform said corruption is not the major problem of Nigeria, which I think I still believe with what he said. Uh, corruption is a symptom of some of our problems. But uh, are we ready? How many of us are ready to take data-driven, uh, evidence-based decision support system uh, without having to go through emotion, through sentiment? Because the power of AI, I, I truly believe AI can do much for us. Uh, in as much as I believe it, danger is massive, but uh, the possibility we could tap from this AI system is massive. But are we ready to take AI revolution? Are we ready to take uh, the AI transformation? Because AI have no respect for gender. You know, uh, usually in our society, you see this queue is for women. AI have no respect for that. AI have no respect for alpha. I have no respect for bishop, for reverend father, for, for high chief. You know, it see everyone neutral. Unless if someone doing the algorithms infuse his own or her own bias. So how ready are you, th you think Nigerians are ready to go through the usual uh, AI system? I've just mentioned uh, 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 election that happened in Nigeria. We have seen how INEC uh, use uh, voter, digital voter register where voters are, digital, are registered digitally where voters use their card to authenticate their uh, participation in the election process. And, and probably electronic voting is also an emerging technology that many countries are thinking of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, implementing in their country. So let's have an open discussion. You know, I just want every one of you to maybe one or two minutes to say what you want to say, or maybe you can tell us things that we don't know before that we could drive from this emerging technology. I would love to hear things coming from your own bias or from your own area of, uh, of expertise. And uh, we had this robot discussion in our class. I think uh, we met almost uh, nine times uh, this semester. Uh, we were able to, I mean, we were able to go through the, the ethics part of the emerging technologies. 
And we even have a book that we, we have that we share among ourselves, the emergent text. And the beauty of that book, Abdul, we will still share with the student. This book is almost uh, 10 years old. But what the author said is clearly what is happening now in our ecosystem. So just have an open thought. Uh, you are expert in emerging technology because you are a PhD candidate and you are expert in your field. And how do you think this will interfere with uh, Nigeria going forward? ICT. Mm -hmm. uh, ICT can play an important role to fight against the corruption by reducing the information asymmetry. I think it can also play an important role. Yeah, someone said blockchain can be used in election uh, from, the, from the audience. Someone said, how can I be used to track the money in circulation outside the banking sector? Mm -hmm. How can blockchain be deployed to enhance free and fair credible election? I think this is a good question mm -hmm. uh, from the audience. Mm -hmm. And someone, yeah. Yeah, go on, please. So I think um, using AI, we can use AI for budgeting. Every single year in Nigeria, you hear budget party. <laughs> Every single year. So we need to accept that as humans, we have failed to um, present a proper budget that will prosper us as a country. So we, it is time to give way for the machines. So we need to we need to look we need to look towards that direction. When we train this um, this machines with our previous budgets, they will be able to come up with something um, uh, something concrete with data driven. They know areas where we have the poor concentrated. What, what are we giving? Um, how much are we budgeting? They know how many children that we are expecting to go back to school. How much are we budgeting? So, but humans we would always move most of the money to where we have interest. So, I think um, we can use AI in budgeting. I think we can use AI or um, blockchain for fertilizer distribution in the country. That has been, that has been another, um, I, I can see most of uh, the participants saying we need to feed ourselves first. So when we, when we ad adopt blockchain for fertilizer distribution, I think we will get, um, it will be more effective. Uh, from our Minister of Agriculture, Akimimi Adeshina, introduced something like that. Wallet. Where, yeah. Wallet. Yeah, yeah, wallet. Where farmers can can buy. immediately he left office. I don't think that technology is uh, is being used today. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, these are areas where we should focus our energy on. Thank you. Uh, based on what Emmanuel said now, women are the main issue in the matter. Environment, corruption, various issues that are plaguing Nigeria as we have it. We human beings, we are the main, we are the main, uh, we are the main, uh, we are the main issue. And uh, you said something now that machines should be given the uh, opportunity <laughs> to do, but we also have to limit the kind of control we give machines. We don't want to have issues of. Uh, I, I believe everyone uh, watch movies. There's a movie uh, by Marvel which uh, which deals with uh, 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 this uh, Javis um, Javis and uh, AI centric uh, machines that are giving authority that are giving uh, this thing. Uh, Ultron Ultron it was a robot that was uh, that had uh, this thing uh, that had this thing that was incorporated with the AI techniques and everything. So it's lens it's this thing itself that human being were the issues, and then it's so that we have to eradicate human. So the issue of control has to be there. So that we will not build machines that will be more smarter than us, that will see the need for uh, women to be eradicated, that will see the need for issues that are concerning human beings to not be there again. Because cyber security is a, a, is a field I'm passionate about. And then there are certain techniques, there are certain, uh, this, there are certain uh, uh, techniques and uh, procedures that are being incorporated in uh, cyber security, whereby if it's applied, to this feed, it will apply to corruption, it will apply to various issues that are plaguing Nigeria. I feel 
we, we could solve some of these issues yeah. if only the governments are able to bring us back together that will, that, that will write uh, policies. And I believe there are policies already. We have the Data Protection Act. We have Cybercrime Act. A lot of uh, acts, but are they being utilized by the government? Which is I also an this issue. This is exactly what someone said. He said, all this tech, but who will implement them? I think it's us, and that's why we are doing this. Also, very interesting uh, feedback from someone. Uh, someone mentioned AI is good, but implementation uh, will be a problem, just like football, VAR in England. Implementation is the problem because it's <laughs> human that's controlled the machine. <laughs> so someone, someone also said uh, AI is good, but it is bias and what I mean we talk about that bias you know I have issue with the AI bias because I said this in a conference uh, about two uh, three months ago in Australia and what I said is you see guys most of this data that we're using for machine learning is not African data it's not African oh, data yeah. it's a European it's a British data where our system is working very well in our own country we are trying to go into that our data in fact someone said this our data is not digital we're not even talking about digitalized data so if AI is leveraging data uh, from foreign countries and AI is written by European or by British or by German or by Chinese, they will infuse their own, their own bias. And I have to say this before I let you go, Abdul. You know, most of us know Professor Indigusi Akeke. I was you know, about to say yeah, that. Yeah, I invited him to this university. Like he gave a keynote three years speech. Ago, four years. And, you know, I mean, you were part of the... You were part mm. of the I asked uh, yeah, the question. Yeah. So, uh, Abdul asked the same question. So, <laughs> and so. the question still passes. In fact, Indubisi <laughs> Akeke, you remember one of the professors of medicine, yeah. said to him, because Indubisi came with a solution that will tell you you have malaria. Yeah, malaria. By just mm. taking your blood sample and putting it in the mm. machine. You say, oh, you have a, a typhoid, you have the but he, the machine will not tell you you have cancer. Mm. And someone said, so are you trying to say that this machine will take over my role as a medical doctor? But mm. individual KQ responded to him, no, I'm not doing this to take over a doctor's job. He, because I know in my village, and I know in Richland's village, they don't have a permanent doctor who is doing the job. But this machine will help us solve a simple common disease. Because the common disease we have in Nigeria is where it's malaria, is uh, cholera, is, I mean, that's the common issue. And he said this, you remember Abdul, uh, in the meeting, he said, uh, 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 if AI is not being put in the forefront, this emerging tech is not put in the forefront, the chance for us getting prosperity is high. And this clearly aligned with what uh, Adam Smith said. I think he's a founder of capitalism. He said by, from his prediction, because he said capitalism may end by the end of 500 years. And from his prediction, I think by, by 2060, we should reach the end of capitalism. But recently, some of the economists, in fact, I read work done by Amitya Sen, uh, by this Abiji, uh, the guy in charge of uh, uh, poverty action lab at MIT, uh, they said to us that, yes, uh, people are now much more participating in the uh, capital economy, people in the rural area that are globalized, but that, but digital revolution is excavating the gap of people that have and don't have. And I think that's what we discussed uh, in our last week discussion, digital divide. If we are not working hard towards bridging the digital divide, a lot of uh, consequences can, can come across. And someone said, uh, low, he said, how can we use AI to, you know, to improve or to accelerate uh, law and putting things into order, like the police. Uh, like the teachers, some of us are corrupt, you know. How do we use AI? Like at Bayes University, I have to say this, uh, we deploy emerging technology. Since inception, we never allow students to write name and number in their script. So we use barcode technology. I think you are all students here, you can confirm. So I cannot score you zero because you go to Cholo, you go to Mox, or because I just dislike you because you are black, you know. So we have already put that in place, and we use plagiarism detection software, which most of you know. If you have your work, you have to turn. I think someone asked me this question yesterday. I said, don't worry about doing the check because students will know a uh, fine way to beat the, the, the technology, but just drop it for me. I'll, so a lot of things uh, could be, I'm just trying to respond to what the participants said to summarize it up. And someone talked about uh, revenue leakages. And I've said this in one of the organizations that invited me to talk. I said, if I am in charge of parallel revenue, I know who is earning money or who is not earning money by just looking at your BBN. Now we have over 56,000 uh, BBN uh, uh, captured in Nigeria. I mean, 60-something thousand now. 
and then 60 something million. And we have about over 100,000, I mean, over 100 million mobile money. With a simple algorithm, simple machine learning, I know Abdul worked with Pest3, he earned big salary. You know, if I look at his <laughs> account like, and he's earning like, something, something like, more than what he's supposed to earn, <laughs> then I will flag him up. I will say, okay, what is happening? I know what okay. Ibrahim is earning. Okay. I know what Abdul Mutalib is. I know what Emmanuel is. Because Emmanuel is a merchant. So if I see something more than that, if I see money being deposited beyond, because most of the traders now use their personal account just to bid the. So the potential of getting this is really, 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 really massive. So I will just uh, open the floor for Abdul and the rest uh, to contribute. Then we can wrap it up. So I think um, you've mentioned one thing that uh, data is the oil, and the integrity of that data is what we need to do to train this model to become much more predictive that predict right thing for us, right? So, uh, for example, you mentioned about Dr. Ndvisi Okweke coming, training the model with uh, US data <laughs> and to come and predict for us in Nigeria. So, um, to just um, summarize, uh, one thing I see is that um, we have NIMSI, we have voters registration, we have BVN. I think all these things have to be harmonized to become provide unique identity for individuals. With that, AI will work very, very well for us. But you have different kind of identity for one person, it will not work. Yeah. What they have done, which we admire in the US, is every citizen has one unique identity. It's either you or it's not you. So once we have that, then the issue about corruption will begin to reduce. Because just like you said, I can easily check what Mr. Hay have in his account, Mr. B, and there will be one sole government entity that have the right to go into it. There's no how you bypass tax in developed countries. In fact, once we begin to put all these mechanisms together here, you see corruption will begin to reduce. It's because of these loopholes that is there that this thing still persists. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of comment coming from the participants. Someone mentioned crude oil. Yeah. In Saudi Arabia, they track every drop of oil that goes out of their shores and uh, mm. the mining, you know, and uh, in fact, I was in Ghana for a conference organized by Bill and Melinda Gates on data governance. In fact, someone came from an organization managing the economic tree. This is one of the finest scientists Africa produced. He worked with a different agric revolution in Africa, but he's now leading the Ghana agri, I mean, economic tree agency. And I asked this question, I said, what is your mandate? He said, I'm tracking every economic tree in, 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 in Ghana. And you know, this is coconut, this is uh, mango, this is uh, goba. So we are tracking them. And we are leveraging machine learning to know when next they will produce so that we can have revenue properly, so that we don't have somebody going to cut our economic tree. So a lot of uh, things and possibility are, are there out for us. So just let's take one or two minutes, just wrap it up because I know Abdul Hamid had a class by 12.30, so we truly appreciate your commitment. Most of you are fasting, and I know this is the last day of Ramadan. Many of you spend the whole night doing night budget, <laughs> but you were able to, uh, to make it here. And Emmanuel, you know, you are a big trader, so every hour for you count. Probably you have to shut down your business uh, if you don't have a CCTV camera. <laughs> you know, I always say, in fact, we didn't even talk about image processing. So the major area, uh, where uh, uh, we just need to do more. In this university, every classroom has a camera. And if lecturer is not in class, we know he's not there. And we're even infusing uh, machine learning uh, technology to the cameras to even count attendance. Uh, because one of the major problems we have from the youngsters, the youngsters don't want to come to class. I'm lucky I have 100% participation because most of you are, <laughs> are mature. But if it is undergraduate class, I'm not sure I can see half of this. So this is an area where, and I think being in Abuja, we could see a lot of camera installation going forward that have to do with the speed and even counting. Someone said to me recently that the federal government is counting how many cars come to Abuja every day. And he said, if you notice along the road, you can see a rock that just passed, you had some bumps uh, around. So the federal government is counting the number of cars that are coming to Abuja. And some of these cameras will begin to count how many people uh, uh, in the car. And I think that's what modern countries do uh, to manage traffic because traffic management is one of the major, major issues. And that is linked with waste management. 
Because if you have two million people coming to your city, practically they will drink bottled water, they will eat uh, takeaway. And so you need to find a way to manage that. And that's what many countries use to manage the traffic system. Uh, and even air quality and water quality. You know, the major, and even noise pollution. Because it's what really affects humans. And someone said to me, along Abuja and some major cities, there is a lot of uh, data collected around pollution, uh, 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 noise pollution, or, I mean uh, air pollution, as well as even the water quality. You know, this is one of the major problems in Abuja. So one of my master students is looking at the possibility of even investing. He's working with a, a, a drilling company to see how much borehole is been is been drilling in Nigeria. So a lot of possibility for, for us to leverage. Human problems are massive. If you take SDG, we talked about SDG last week. You know, we have the 17 goals. We are not near to getting that SDG <laughs> to realize. We haven't gotten the money to do that. Uh, if you take digital education, I will say $1.4 trillion. It's a big money. Do we have it? How do we get it? How can people, in fact, I remember this guy, Elon Musk, make it open. If most of you can remember, he said, yes, we have this existential problem and threat. Can somebody give me a solution? on how to stop it. And I would be happy to put the money to begin to solve most of the problem. And up to today, I'm not sure he had a very uh, convincing uh, solution. And most of us that work around, Abdul, you evaluated over 500 proposals. <laughs> and I mean, same here, we have a lot of money been sitting idle in different projects, mm -hmm. but we haven't gotten people to even uh, put a very befitting proposal. And as you go, through, Abdul, I will invite you to come and talk to the participant just maybe in 30 minutes to show them opportunity where we could begin to access money. And the problem is not about even the money. I had a chat with uh, one of the uh, head of the United Nations system in Abuja. Mm -hmm. He said, Island, the problem we have in Nigeria is not about money. We have money to spend, but we are not spending the money. My spending limit is about 35%. But we want to see meaningful proposals that we can put the money into the project. And beyond that, what we spend, we need to begin to see impact. impact. I think that's one of the major problems. And as you progress, uh, I'm going to talk around logic model, where you could see input, you put it into your process, into your programming. When you have done the project, you should be able to have some output. But you cannot stop at output. Because if you take all this emerging tech, we use them, social media, Instagram, Snapchat, is an input to us, but we use them extensively. But what is the output? Does that translate to outcome or not? giving us opportunity to even have a good sleep. Because every time you think about the tweet that is coming, the telegram message that is coming, but what are the output? Then if you have the output, what are the outcomes? If you have good outcome, then what of the impact? Does that translate to nation building? Does that translate to lack of corruption? Does that translate to maybe good sleep? <laughs> so a lot of possibility we could drive. In fact, there is no sector that is not well been taken care of we talk about the emergency. Even the woman friend Akara, how can she have <laughs> her Akara been sell at the right time? You know, I mentioned in, my, in this university, I use one guy called Bala. He sells here in this university. But for the last nine years, I used his case study uh, to, to teach students how to use innovation and emerging tech. This guy used mobile money. Even when people don't even use mobile money, he take order, he have a hotline. Whenever you call him, he picked the call. And he did even delivery beyond that. He leveraged this logistics and delivery company. And I remember, I'm not going to call a name. I went to one of the big shops in Abuja to buy something. When I bought, I said, can I travel? He said, no, 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 we don't take transfer. And it's not even local shop. It's an international shop. And they said, we don't take transfer. But the guy, Balasuya, is leveraging just anything. POS, I can take. So think about it. At a human level, uh, and I'm putting this to the, to the participant. How can we use this tech? How can we support government at the policy level? And I have to say this, I have to confess, uh, government of Nigeria now are now listening to, to scientists and, 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 and innovators. They want to see very, very meaningful solution from them. And we as individuals, how do we begin to leverage, pilot ourselves going well into this emerging technology? As well as even people with edge, you know? A former colleague that worked with us here, in, I mean, at Bayes University, currently special advisor to the president on ICT policy, Salih Desuki, came to me about five months ago to say, Rislan, can you give me an opportunity to share my research? I'm doing research around virtual reality. How can people that are old use this virtual reality to accelerate their social well-being? 
And it's an interesting uh, presentation. And he came and he did have the workshop for us. And I have a grandmother who is almost 100 plus, And I have the virtual reality glass. And I say, Mama, I want to show you uh, Kaaba. I want you to do virtual hatch. And I put the glass for her. Within a few seconds, her uh, nature, her mood changed. She started saying, you know, all this and trying, because she sees the thing in reality. And we have seen how youngsters, how children are now using virtual reality to ask, because we keep talking about France, Germany, the Great Berlin Wall, you know, but we we'll never go there. But with the virtual reality, with the augmented reality, a lot of possibility around that. I'm just trying to wrap it up. So the possibility, the opportunity to drive from this emerging tech is massive. Mm. But at the same time, we have to be very mindful about the privacy uh, around our data, around our human. Because number one thing, we are human. We need to have that dignity. Human need to have a dignity while we are exploring the emerging tech. So for the participant, please uh, have an open mindset. Go to the internet, search things around emerging technology. We'll consolidate some notes from you. And I have to appreciate my participants. They generously agreed yesterday to put a note together uh, for this engagement. So as soon as we have it, we'll add it up. And they agree to come up with 100 questions that we can ask you to test if you really learn something uh, from this engagement. And, I truly and with your permission, if you agree, you give me your LinkedIn uh, handle we we'll share with the participants so that they can get in touch, and also your email. If there is anything, the participants would love to uh, connect with you and share with you, and maybe they can learn from your mentorship. Particularly, I know Abdul is doing a lot. Uh, he's all over the world, and we cannot thank uh, Emmanuel, we cannot thank Ibrahim, Abdul Hamid, and uh, uh, Potekin Patendi. So just wrap it up. Take two minutes, then we'll close the conversation. <laughs> two minutes is too much. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> no, I mean, you can. If you have something to say, if you don't have... No, no. Uh, everything we have been talking about since uh, we started this program has been about uh, we focused it mostly on uh, data being the new oil mm -hmm. because with data various activities can be carried out AI can work machine learning can do uh, machine learning can do its work you can do blockchain activities election various activities that will leverage on emerging technology will surely work if the data is there because you can't keep on, uh, with Nigeria is a sovereign state, is a, is a, is a sovereign state, is a federal republic. We can't keep on leveraging on uh, foreign data to carry out our activities. Where researchers, most of research, they don't have uh, concrete data to carry out research. So data needs to be more facilitated. We need to gather data about Nigeria as its, as its own. Then uh, looking at uh, the federal government, they keep on initiating various initiative initiatives. We have BVN. We have national ID, we have a national name, national identity number. Various platforms are there, but we still have issues of uh, insecurity, we still have issues of uh, corruption, we still have issues of this and that. Because how would a uh, certain money enter a uh, CEO, uh, CEO account and you won't be able to know that ah, this money is just, apart from okay, banks, immediately a certain amount uh, enters your account. They'll, call, they'll, they'll block your account, you have to come to the bank and uh, do. So various initiatives are there that I imagine technology can leverage on and that can be used to solve these issues. So Nigeria is, I can say Nigeria is, uh, Nigeria is, uh, is, uh, is ready to accept, uh, is ready to, uh, to accept uh, emerging technology. It's just for the human being itself. We, 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 we the human being, to, to have the interest. The interest to use these technologies to achieve uh, to achieve our aim, and then uh, taking uh, the, this thing also, uh, I appreciate that the the participants for attending programs like this. Um, based on what we discuss, uh, there are information of various uh, information of that are being used to uh, to 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 learn, but practice makes uh, there's a code that says practice makes uh, perfect, so. Uh, and uh, I, I believe in the next six months, we'll be able to, uh, the participants will be able to come uh, have fiscal presence to do uh, internship and all those kind of things together. So practice, 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 practice is all about it. So you don't just keep on learning, 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 learning. From the participant, we could do someone that will be the, that, 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 that will be the next emerging technology for us. There are already emerging technologies there, but we could do someone that will improve on it. Nigeria, Nigeria, Niger, Niger, Nigerians can, can really, can, can really assist, can really, can really get the work done. Thank you. All right, just a lot of, a lot of things coming from there. Yeah. Someone mentioned tourism. Yeah. So Someone just, mentioned tourism. Just, it's interesting. Just, just, in Rwanda, 
I and Abdul were in Rwanda last year, and we have seen how Rwanda is. In part, you know, we wanted the zip line. You know, they are just mm. trailblazing, trail, trail, trailblazing in this yeah, area. Yeah. And I think Nigeria have a lot of potential because we have diverse ecosystem and we have number. And I mentioned this uh, last week in the ICT for day. So just to add is, um, I think a lot of content has been bombarded on these uh, participants. And one thing I would just advise is for you to have open and inquisitive mindsets. Ask why and also see how you can use this technology to solve your own local problems. Look around you, see what you're doing and see how you can adapt this, local, this technology locally. That's productive use of technology, actually. Technology is there, but how do you make use of them to make sure that it benefits you, yourself as an individual? Mm -hmm. Then from there, you learn, you practice, you learn, you perfect it, and you can now go global with your innovation. So look at if you are someone making uh, small chops, how do you use this technology you know, to enhance you know, your outreach? Things like that, this is what you should look into. Mm -hmm and see how you use that to solve your local problem and take it global. That's just my advice to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have something that I have to share. Someone said from the chat that his younger brother developed or developing a machine that could track the uh, yeah, ripeness of uh, watermelon. Yeah, which is good. So I think please do an email to us about this. We'll be happy to see how we can. Uh, and you know, someone mentioned she's working with a tourism and airline and ticketing system. But she's not afraid of AI. But you should be afraid of AI because the most uh, money spent now for virtual reality and augmented reality is spent by the airline, Airbus, uh, uh, Boeing, and they are spending huge amount of money for a virtual tourism. Whereas in the near future, there may be no need to travel, uh, basically, you know, because we have seen how COVID-19 total uh, the entire airline completely grounded. And many airlines are now even struggling to see how they can get back. And even virtual interaction, Hawaii, all these uh, interesting places where people go and relax, you don't need to go there now. With your virtual reality, you can feel as if you are in, you are in uh, Beverly Hills jogging, and you could even see all the artists. You could even, see, yeah. Even with, uh, what do you call it, Google Maps now? Yes. With Google Maps, yeah. you can zoom to any city yeah. in the world, yeah. Yeah. And, and you'll be able to walk around yeah. just as if you're there. So... And even if I happening. always tell my students, go to Silver Bath, yeah. uh, you could experience even uh, the, in fact, the virtual reality in practice. In fact, when you are watching your movie, when you go into water supply, they will supply the water for you. You have as if you are within the, the ecosystem. And even in the fact. surgery now. In fact, one of my boss said to me recently, he said, Richland, my son enrolled into non dissecting medical school in the University of Birmingham. You don't need to trust cadaver. No cadaver in the university. You could study medicine without touching cadaver because most of the surgeries that will happen in the future, they are not surgeries that you need to touch or you need to cut the body. You are using laser technology and few emerging technology around biomedical uh, and bioscience in there. And when I did the search, it's non dissecting medical university. And some universities are uh, really, really creating even the learning barrier. Lesson or something that you need to learn in five, ten years, you can learn in one or two years because you have, you have been immersed into the learning practice. Because maybe if I'm teaching programming, I mean, most of what I went to the university a bit long, when we are taught programming is by pen and paper, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because there is no access to this technology. Yes. But as you progress, now, even before children come to you, uh, they are already prepared. I mean, my kids are here with me. They know how to do basic scratch. So the possibility of this emerging technology, particularly virtual reality, Augmented reality, even in a car industry, Abdul, most of the cars that are coming are now equipped with virtual, so that you don't need to have accident. Many countries have recorded zero accident. Yeah. Zero accident. Even, even suicide now, people can commit suicide in just one second. So the possibility is really, really, really massive around that. So um, just to say that um, I think for institutions like BASE and also government agencies, they need to invest in a plutonium. Yeah. You understand, I was in, um, Ar Ar um, let me just say, Arabic uh, University of Science and American Studies recently in Alexandria, and the platinum was wonderful. We are as if we're immersed in the entire Egypt, you know, uh, civilization, when a video was being played for us from there. So that kind of learning is what we should be looking to now. 
you know, uh, and it will go a long way, really. So I think we've exhausted time yeah, and... Yeah, uh, just more thing from this. Somebody said he's <laughs> developing an app that will diagnose disease and even link you up with the hospital. So thank you very much, Emmanuel. One final word for you, then we, we will call it up. Okay, just like uh, mm. my colleague well said, learn and implement. We need to start solving problems. Yeah. We need to start thinking about ideas, where to implement this. Um, Mr. Abdul said we can apply some of this technology even in small shops. So don't, don't just think about the sophisticated part of it. Currently, sir, in my supermarket, we, we, use, um, we use AI to generate OS out of stock list. Okay? So we, we can predict seller is coming. We know items that we, that, that we can sell during seller. So we do this, and I can tell you, we are harvesting massive results as a result of this, um, <laughs> as a result of this technology. So let's not think about it uh, using AI to travel to the moon. Those are too complex. Let's, let's, start, from the, let's start from the basic. And um, when we start from the basic, we'll be, so, we'll be amazed at the transformation. Thank you. Thank you. I think a lot of good comment coming from the app. And I think I always say this. I'm involved in many startup ecosystems. We have done a lot around that. And my good friend Andrew, I'm inviting him next, uh, next to, I mean, in the next uh, live section to come and talk with us. He is the president of Young Innovators of Nigeria. We have worked extensively over the last eight years. So if you have a solution to sell, it will definitely sell. Don't worry about the government. I've seen many youngsters uh, that got a breakthrough. You don't need government to really sell a solution. The problem is most of us have solution for a big uh, organization. So always think small, think about the local grassroots uh, problem, and provide grassroots solution. Definitely uh, you have a possibility around that. So thank you very much all uh, for coming, and thank you very much to the technical uh, team for putting this solution all together for us. But before you stop, I have an information. So by now, if you log into your account, you should, have, you should have four modules in your account. The digital literacy uh, is a foundational course uh, that all of you uh, got a role earlier. We have about 56,000 students. Then the second module we had is ICT for D, which is over yesterday. So, but you still have opportunity to drop your assignment. We'll stop collecting assignment uh, by, let's say, by Monday. We'll stop taking assignment by Monday. Then we have the Emerging Technologies module now, which is currently ongoing. We started putting content for you. Then we now have the, the introduction to innovation uh, that will start from next week, Friday. And we got some feedback from some of the participants that can we have uh, a week off next week? So I will talk to colleagues if there is a possibility to have one week off so that you could celebrate your celebration. But I don't think that is need for us to really, really uh, have a week off because we are all fasting. Most of us are fasting and we have job, we have family that we have to really take care of. So if you are not in this platform, do let me know. And I think, Abdul, going forward, we need to enable the assessment for the digital literacy. Let us have more people uh, participating. Open it. It's open. So let people keep doing then we keep adding them into the digital literacy. Then they can learn uh, on their own. And if there is any way we can help, we'll be happy to have it. But we are planning to have the first uh, physical class in Jigawa and Abuja uh, the last week of uh, April. And someone mentioned uh, we didn't really have a final word from Kaduna and Kasina. But as I said, we are talking. Uh, we are talking to Engineer Bello. His essay to the governor on ICT, he came to to see how we can have this uh, physical location in Kaduna. I think Abdul is also championing how to have this physical location in, in Kwara. Uh, Kazina, I'm talking to uh, Naufal for a possibility of supporting uh, participants from Kazina, as well as Gaju, Gajam from Zampara. And I'm talking to somebody uh, from Ebonyi for a possibility. And someone from Anambra uh, is interested in putting uh, a location somewhere around uh, Unguru. It's just not too far away from where the airport is a friend, and he's interested in bringing people to, uh, to do something uh, physical. And as you progress, 
we are open for conversation. And I think someone is talking to Grema, is talking to Yobe and uh, and uh, uh, Borno State for a possibility of having uh, a physical location. And someone from Lego is talking to us. So and we are also talking to the World Bank uh, for its ability of giving us more funding uh, to open up a uh, uh, location. And we are also talking to the Ministry of Digital Economy. Uh, the DG Nida Kashipu uh, was part of the unveiling of this program when we launched in Jigawa. And we have somebody from Nida also uh, that joined Bayes University uh, during the launch. So we are open for collaboration. We are open for uh, participation. We are open for innovation. If you think as members, as participants, that is a way we can get more physical locations, uh, we can make this program more effective, uh, we'll be happy to, to take that feedback. So, but on a final note, uh, thank you very much all uh, for taking part of this. And thank you very much, uh, participant, for your interest and agility and, and also your uh, resiliency to be part of this program. Upon all the uh, challenges we all experience uh, as a human power, connectivity, and even data literacy. And if you have any issue, uh, we have a link that we shared earlier. Just comment. The team will be happy to respond to you. The team are working very hard to respond to emails. On average, about 500 emails do come to us, and the team respond. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll close the section. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Endurance. Thank you.